Hello, and welcome to Euphobia. For returning phobies, welcome back. And to everyone else, welcome to my virtual house of horrors. There are some stories that are almost too ridiculous to be believed. The details of these stories are so bizarre, so outlandish, that they stick with us for a really long time, popping up out of nowhere with a, hey, remember this? Such is the case of Shayla Labar, the woman who turned her multi-million dollar ranch into a BDSM torture dungeon. Trigger warning straight off the bat, we will be discussing themes of childhood assault, attempted self-harm, and extreme violence. If any of that sounds like too much for you, I encourage you to sit this one out. Now, with that being said, if you're sure you're ready, let's get into it. A rocky start. Born Shayla K. Bailey on July 4th, 1958 in Fort Payne, Alabama, Shayla was the youngest of six siblings. She was desperate to prove her worth and gain her parents' approval and had aspirations of becoming a famous country singer or model from an early age. But things weren't all as they appeared, and Shayla's home life was anything but peaceful. Her father, Manuel, was a serious alcoholic, and whenever he drank, he would take his anger out on the rest of his family. Verbal and physical abuse were the norm throughout Shayla's childhood, including a particularly nasty incident where her father threw a paint can at her and hit her in the head. The carport was right there, and he picked up this can of uh, antifreeze, and it was in a... It comes in a can like paint thinner does. They're square, kind of, and tall, and they're metal. And it, it obviously had something in it because when he slung it, it, it was with force and he, he threw it at towards us and it hit Sheila. She, she, it caught her in the side of the head here. She, she reached up like this to try to stop it and it, it hit her fingers, you know, her four little fingers were dented in from this, this bottom ridge or something on that can. Shayla and her older sister, Lynn, would later go on to claim that there were times their father's abuse became sexual in nature, too. Now, despite the turbulence of her childhood, Shayla led a fairly normal life, at least at first. She was, at one point in time, a beauty contestant winner. She is from the South, and she could turn on Southern accent and charm, and she could be very charming. She graduated from Fort Payne High School in 1976 and got a job at a local motel to help support her family. When she was 23, Shayla met her first husband, 19-year-old John Baxter. The two quickly fell in love, and a whirlwind romance had them tying the knot on New Year's Eve 1981. The marriage didn't last long, however, as John filed for divorce six weeks later. His reason? He had a young daughter from a previous relationship, and while he'd been away on business, Shayla had reportedly locked her into a tiny closet for misbehaving. Seeing the red flags for what they were, John took his daughter and got out of there as fast as he could. Shayla didn't seem all that bothered bothered by the divorce. In fact, it didn't take her long to dive into a new relationship with a man called Ronnie Jennings. They were co-workers and would often skip work to smoke illegal substances. Now, Ronnie was a bit of a ladies' man, and at first, he didn't want to marry Shayla. But after some persuasion, he eventually agreed, and the two of them moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ronnie realized he'd made a mistake almost immediately. Supposedly, as soon as they left the wedding venue, Shayla broke down and started saying they should have never gotten married. It didn't take long for her to start demanding they get a divorce. Shayla was prone to mood swings that would often leave her violent and foul-tempered and would have Ronnie fearing for his life. But for some reason, he didn't see this as a reason to leave her. It was around this time that Shayla really began to struggle with her mental health. One day, after a fight with Ronnie, Shayla took a bunch of sedatives and crashed her car. She spent eight days in a coma before she was sent to a psychiatric ward where she was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. It's a condition that causes noticeable changes in a person's behavior. Symptoms include hallucinations, depression, mania, a disturbance in cognition, and disorganized thoughts, speech, or moods. Shayla later told Lynn that her stay at the psych ward was one of the worst experiences of her life. She claimed she was ripped 
attacked by an orderly while she was there, and this led to Lynn being hesitant about getting Shayla for their help. Even when it was clear that Shayla was struggling, Lynn hesitated, saying, I didn't want to put her in a situation where she was going to be raped or made worse. But back to Ronnie. After four long years of a tumultuous marriage, he finally agreed to get a divorce. But only after she threatened to kill him in his sleep with a pair of scissors? He would later go on to tell the Boston Herald that she's just crazy, to put it bluntly. Shayla doesn't care about anyone else, she just wants everything her way. Now let's fast forward to 1987. Shayla was attracted to easily manipulated men. She wasn't interested in men who were assertive or persistent. She wanted to boss them around and control them without getting any kind of pushback. And she found that the best way of attracting that kind of man was through personal ads in the newspaper. She'd had some success with it too. After a string of brief relationships, she finally found the one. 60-year-old Wilfred Labar, a widowed chiropractor living in New Hampshire. Despite the 30-year age gap, the two hit it off, and it wasn't long before Shayla was moving out to join him on his ranch. They were never officially married, but Shayla ended up taking his last name anyway, saying that they were common law married. Their relationship, just like all of Shayla's previous relationships, was rocky, and there are reports of family members asking him to get restraining orders against her, but they never stuck. Shayla remained on the ranch until Wilfred's death in 2000. Nothing has ever officially been confirmed, and the autopsy report states that he died from natural causes, but Wilfred's family believes she had something to do with it. His daughter, Laura, told the Portsmouth Herald that from the first time she entered his life, she stressed him out. He was having chest pains, lying down in between patients. I loved my father so much and couldn't handle what she was doing to him. At the time of his death, Shayla was set to inherit his entire $2 million ranch. His family fought the decision, but were told that they only had a 50-50 chance of succeeding and that they need to pay $50,000 upfront for legal fees. And so, Shayla suddenly had a whole lot of land and a whole lot of money at her disposal. Land and money that she could use without consequence. The first victim. Shayla's insatiable lust for weak men eventually led her to start propositioning homeless men. She'd offer them a place to stay, using the promise of sex and drugs to get them to agree. This was how she met Michael DeLogue. Michael's story is an unhappy one. Even prior to his disappearance, he led an extremely troubled life. He was 37 when he met Shayla, and he was the exact kind of man she was looking for. He had very little work experience, so it was hard for him to find regular work or hold down a job. He struggled with substance abuse, and he was a frequent visitor at the local homeless shelter. Some reports even suggest that he was estranged from his family at the time, making him even more isolated. He was really funny. I mean, he always, he had a lot of energy. And he was very happy. He said that he had met this woman, Sheila, and he was in love with her. Is it any wonder that he jumped at the chance to move in with Shayla? She was offering him a roof over his head and a sense of financial stability. I mean, of course he said yes. Naturally, it didn't take long for their relationship to turn sour, and the two quickly began engaging in an unhealthy version of BDSM. Michael was the ideal submissive. He was entirely dependent on Shayla, which meant that she could do whatever she wanted to him and he wouldn't be able to leave. While movies like Fifty Shades of Grey and 365 Days have brought BDSM into the public's consciousness, they are incredibly inaccurate depictions of what BDSM really is. Something you'll hear a lot in relation to the BDSM scene is how important trust is between partners. Unfortunately for Michael, this wasn't something Shayla cared about. She would regularly cross the line between acceptable BDSM behavior and outright violence. For Shayla, it was never about making her partners feel good. It was about the sense of power and control. In any other situation, the beatings and the violence that she subjected Michael to would be considered abuse. Michael tried to leave the ranch several times. He knew that Shayla's behavior was wrong, and he tried his best to get out. There are multiple reports of him walking the 20 miles it took to reach the local homeless shelter, often in the middle of the night. But no matter how many times he left, Left, Shayla will always show up and take him back to the ranch. The most telling story is that when Michael was living here, in the middle of winter, people saw Michael stumble down this long road in the middle of snow, bleeding from the forehead. And when somebody stopped to ask him what happened, he just kept on going and said one word, he said, Sheila. 
very little is known about what happened to him while he was there. The only solid piece of physical evidence even linking Michael to the ranch was his birth certificate. If she had flushed down the toilet his birth certificate and some other evidence. That's how we even knew about Mike Delage, because there was no report about him missing. And they began to say, who is Mike Delage? But while physical evidence might have been hard to come by, witness reports were not. Michael's family reports that Shayla visited them several times during the time Michael was living on the ranch. His mother, Donna, remembers that Shayla was rude and entitled, and often treated Michael like a servant. If he didn't do what she wanted fast enough, she would get angry. Michael's last visit to his family was an unpleasant one. Donna remembers, Michael had changed his ways. He was pimply-faced and looked like he had lost a lot of weight. He didn't talk very much at all. She did all the talking. That's what Shayla wanted from her victims, total obedience. And she got it. Michael had a hard life, but it was, it was still a life and it needs to be remembered. And whatever happened to him needs to be found out. It's just, it's not right to leave it like this. One witness, Philip Sulos, reported that Shayla regularly beat Michael and that he would never try to fight back. He said that on one occasion, Shayla locked Michael in a windowless storage room and he didn't even try to leave when the door was opened. Another witness, an A. Wigan, had a lot to say about the violence Michael was subjected to. He told police that he had seen Shayla punch, kick, throw, and knock down Michael, as well as beat him senselessly with a large stick. Wiggins stated that there was one instance where he saw a bruise on Michael's stomach severe enough to have caused potential internal injuries. Michael officially went missing in the late summer of 2005. When Wigan asked Shayla where he'd gone, she said, he's gone. I don't know where he is. He left and his family doesn't want anything to do with him. Mike Deloge is listed as a missing person. Um, there is an investigation ongoing into the fact that he has been missing. The second victim. Kenneth County is described by everyone who knew him as a very friendly and likable man. According to his mother, he always had a smile on his face. From a young age, he had dream of serving in the U.S. military. But those dreams would never come to pass. Kenny was always smiling. I mean, he, I never ever seen him not smile. And he'd walk in with that impish grin. And you had to laugh. He had to giggle. At the age of 24, Kenny had the IQ of a person half his age, and it meant that he often struggled with basic tasks. This obviously made him an ideal target for someone like Shayla Labar. He was at a huge disadvantage, and so it was easy for her to manipulate him into doing whatever she wanted. She convinced him to leave his home in Massachusetts and meet her at a local hotel where they slept together in her car in the parking lot. They drank and they ended up having sex in her car at her house in Epping. She does everything she can to isolate him from his parents and, and is successful in doing that. With this newfound sense of power over him, Shayla convinced Kenny to move in with her at the ranch with the promise of a new life. When Kenny reached the ranch, however, it became clear that the promise of a new start had been a lie. Shayla fell back into her usual pattern of behavior, and they entered a BDSM-style relationship. These sessions were brutal, often leaving Kenny covered in burns, cuts, and bruises. The torture took its toll on Kenny, and his health began to visibly decline. In March 2006, police were called to a local Walmart, where staff explained that there was a person inside the store causing a disturbance. When police arrived, they found Kenny, now wheelchair-bound and covered in cuts and bruises, with two five-gallon diesel containers in his shopping cart. He didn't have anything else. Before police had a chance to question him, Shayla showed up and started doing all of the talking for him. She told officers that his injuries were the result of a car accident and that he was using the wheelchair as a joke. Every attempt they made to speak to Kenny was cut off, so they had no choice but to let him go. He looks a little bit ashen in color and he's in a Walmart wheelchair. And I asked him several times, um, you know, if he was okay and uh, if everything was all right, and he refused to talk to us. It was a decision that would have dire consequences. It was around this time that Kenny's mother, Carolyn, started to become suspicious. They were incredibly close and spoke on the phone almost every single day, so when Kenny dropped off the face of the earth, Carolyn knew that something was wrong. And her concerns only got worse when she tried reaching out to Shayla, 
She was told to leave them alone because Kenny was a grown man and they were happy together. Carolyn immediately contacted local police and after speaking with Sean Gallagher, filed a missing persons report. Police attempted to contact Shayla several times but never got an answer. That is, until two days later, when they received a phone call from Shayla. She told him that Kenny had left the ranch and gone on the run. Without giving officers the chance to respond, she began playing a tape recording over the phone. Contents of this recording was strange, to say the least. She said um, that she wanted us to know that, that's, that Kenny left um, and she wanted that he was a pedophile and she was going to play a tape for me that would prove he was a pedophile. And then I heard Sheila say, um, why are you throwing up? stop throwing up and I didn't hear Kenneth talking anymore but then I heard her say um, why are you passing out why did you pass out it began with Shayla announcing that she was a justice of the peace of New Hampshire before moving on to her listing the names of several young family members she then asked Kenny if he had ever been abused by any of them listing off a series of awful crimes. Kenny's voice could be faintly heard answering yes to all of Shayla's questions. When the recording finished playing, Shayla hung up. Later that same day, police visited the Labar Ranch, and what they found there was troubling. While searching the property, they came across an active burn site out in the yard. There was a burnt mattress and a pile of burning hay. And most concerning of all, they found a three and a half inch bone shard with soft tissue still attached. It's probably around six o'clock at night, so it's dusk. Uh, we showed up, there was a burn pile. I kind of moved it a little bit, and I looked down and I saw a piece of flesh. There was a, a, a bone. If I had to make a guess, I would say it was um, maybe an, an upper arm and, and shoulder area. As officers were waiting for backup to arrive, Shayla appeared and told him that the contents of the Walmart bag was either a rabbit or a child monster. Without sufficient evidence, police couldn't arrest her for anything, and so they were forced to let her go. Thankfully, it didn't take them long to get a warrant to search the property. What they found was worse than anything any of them could have imagined. Blood was found in the kitchen, the living room, and in the bedroom. They also found the two diesel canisters they've seen Kenny with the previous week, except this time, they were empty. With all of this evidence stacked against her, Shayla went missing. She was now officially on the run. Luck was not on her side, however, and she began running into some car trouble not long after joining Interstate 293. She obviously Obviously couldn't call anyone for help, which meant that her options were limited, and so she started to hitchhike. The first guy to pick her up, Stefan Martello, agreed to drive her as far as Dorchester, Massachusetts. When he dropped her off at her hotel that evening, she invited him to stay the night. Stefan agreed, and things between the two became quickly physical. After they finished, Shayla told him that he had just had sex with an angel. This unsettled him enough that he quickly got out of there. Good call. It wasn't until he was back at home and watching the news that he realized he just escaped a run-in with Shayla Labar. He immediately contacted the authorities and told them where he'd last seen her. Shayla, meanwhile, had already moved on and made her way to Roxbury. It was here, in a strip mall parking lot, that she met Kenneth Washington. She introduced herself as Casey and sold him a story of being in town on business and the airport losing all of her luggage. Kenneth was obviously sympathetic and invited her into his car. After three days together, Kenneth went home to his family and this is where he learned the truth about his companion. Her name wasn't Casey at all and she was wanted on suspicion of murder. They had plans to meet at Taco Bell the next day, so Kenneth came up with a plan and contacted the local police department. An officer would patrol the area and be on the lookout out for Shayla while Kenneth stood her up. The plan worked. One of the officers noticed a strange woman standing on the sidewalk outside the restaurant. He approached, asking her if her name was Shayla Labar. She denied it at first, but eventually admitted her true identity after he showed her a picture of herself. Shayla Labar was arrested for the murder of Kenneth County on April 2, 2006. The Investigation and the Sentencing how many victims of Shayla Labar are really out there? Investigations of the rant suggest that there are a lot more than we know about. During a 17-day search of the property, investigators found multiple burn piles, similar to the one with a bone fragment. Some of these piles date back as far as 2004. Shayla's journal was among the evidence collected, and inside were several worrying entries. One entry, dated July 2005, around the time that Michael DeLogue officially went missing, had a drawing of a human body with the words, 
110 pounds, 5 foot 4. Next to the drawing were a list of words, incinerated, burned, ashes, bury, and death in all caps. Another page contained details of how to get rid of a body. One, incinerated, burned, ashes, flushed, scatter. Two, water. Three, bury, shovel. Four, private pilot, helicopter, boat, death, torch. The word death was circled. On top of that, they also found three human toes. DNA testing determined that they didn't belong to either of the known victims. So who do they belong to? Chances are, we'll never know. During the course of the investigation, we found not only people that would come forward and say that they knew that other men had stayed at the house, but um, hundreds of audio cassettes of her speaking to different men on chat lines. And so that was always a concern that there were potentially other victims. Shayla deliberately targeted vulnerable men that wouldn't be reported as missing. Richard Cote, a surgeon at the Epping Police Department, had this to say. If she made a homeless guy in New York City and took him home and killed him, we would never know. She was using every and all means of disposal. I think some of that really progressive forensic technology actually got her to the point where she accepted responsibility but proceeded with the insanity. Hopeful with time and further forensic technology, we might one day find out the whole truth. During her trial, Shayla pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and used her previous diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder as evidence. As part of her plea deal, she admitted that prosecutors had enough evidence to show she was guilty, but argued that she wasn't criminally responsible. This means that at trial, you and your lawyers will have to prove that at the time of the murders, you were legally insane and therefore not criminally responsible for your actions. Do you understand that? I do because I was. Her plea was rejected. And in June 2008, the jury found her guilty on two counts of murder. Laughing at the recordings of her police questioning probably didn't help her case. I hereby sentence you to two life in prison without the possibility of parole sentences at the New Hampshire State Prison, and you are remanded to the custody of the sheriff. I am very happy she got this life, two life sentences in prison. She can't get out. She can't go hurt nobody else. It's been two years now since my son's horrific murder. And now my son Kenny can rest. She's currently serving two life sentences. While it can never undo the damage, it's nice to know that in this case, justice was served. Thanks for watching, you guys. As always, don't be shy. Like and subscribe for more. Till next time, and stay safe out there.